Okay, wow, this is a great audience. Thank you very much. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, the world's economic future. Uh, you know, small topic. Um, I'm sure we'll get through it in 20 minutes, no problem at all. Um, I'm going to start with, if you like, where we are now, the kind of economic crisis in Europe, but I'm going to move on pretty swiftly from that because I want to talk about long-term stuff. I want to talk about where we are going to get to towards the end of this century. Uh, if I can put it this way, by the time you guys are getting pretty old, by the time you're kind of getting older than me, I want to see where we're going to get to, whether we're going to have a world worth living in. Um, and I have some good news, I hope. Bear with me, but I think there is some good stuff out there, some stuff worth aiming for. But let's start with the, where we are now. The world, as we're all seeing, is changing fast. The relationship between the North and the South, the economic changes and so on, are really big right now. I think it's a fundamental shift going on. The past two years, two or three years, have been a turning point for, if you like, us in the West, or me in Europe. I know we have a global audience here, uh, but for people like me in the West, it's the end of our dominance, I think. We're on the way down. Our political and economic control of the world is right now ending. The debt crisis in Europe is going to drag on, and it's going to drag down Western economies and their influence. The head of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Christine Lagarde, we still have a European in charge of the International Monetary Fund. I think there'll be Chinese and Indians in charge of it very soon. Christine Lagarde has been warning for over a year now that the West faces a lost decade. Well, I think if it's only a decade, we'll be doing quite well. But a lost decade as governments retrench and reorganize themselves in the face of this huge debt crisis that there is in Europe and North America and one or two other places. Our economies in Europe, in the West, are going nowhere. And that's, I guess, symbolized by this picture, just kind of rust belt picture. This is the... This is what's happening in the West now. Whereas elsewhere, things are very different. Many developing countries have barely missed a beat. Their economies are still growing. China, for instance, this is a picture just I took a few years ago uh, of a, a computer mouse factory. A third of all the computer mice in the world are made in that factory. So probably more of us touch a product of that factory. Just a small factory, actually, in China than any other... Uh, than the product of any other factory in the world. Um, but anyway, China's GDP is growing 8% a year still. India slipped back a little bit, 6%. God, we in Europe would be happy for 6% right now, I tell you. Sub-Saharan Africa grew by 5% in 2012. The World Bank thinks that Africa could be on the brink of an economic takeoff. Parts of Africa look now like China did 20 years ago, and some people expect the growth in the next 20 years there to be as big as it's been in China. So by the time the West's lost decade is over, and I'm assuming it's only going to be a decade because I think many of us would expect it to be two or three decades. The phrase was coined in Japan in the 1990s. Japan is currently on its third decade of no economic growth. But at any rate, when that decade or whatever it is is over, the economies of the rest of the world will effectively have doubled. So Europe will be going static, the rest of the world will have doubled in size. And they'll have doubled their use of the world's resources. The biggest metals and mining companies are gonna be in China and Brazil. The biggest agricultural companies will be perhaps in Brazil, certainly in India. The biggest petrochemical companies will be in the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and so on. And their contribution to climate change and global pollution will double too. China is already a bigger emitter of greenhouse gases than the US. In fact, China's pollution of pretty much all kinds is bigger than anywhere else's. That's Shenyang, um, a medium-sized industrial city in China just a year ago or so ago. Chinese pollution is a huge issue, not least in China. The world's economic situation is changing. The politics is changing as well. 
The old idea of European sort of center of democracy and the rest of the world sort of struggling to catch up is not really the truth anymore. The Arab Spring brought new governments across North Africa. People are fighting for democracy all over the world, and it's happening. In Africa, two out of three countries now hold regular elections. The system's not perfect, but it's developing. The elections are happening. Most of Latin America, which when I was a student was largely run by military dictatorships, most of Latin America is now democratic. And it's in Europe where democracy is under stress. In places like Greece and Italy, where political control is now out of the hands of democratic institutions, it's being run by bankers and um, others demanding economic reforms. And there are fascist groups growing up, particularly in Greece. Demo democracy is now under threat in Europe. Now that's a huge change. The world is fundamentally changing before our eyes. And the new sort of modernist places, the new places to marvel at, are places like Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and, the, and that is the cathedral in Brazil, modernist cathedral, uh, one of the most admired buildings in the world. And the, the repairs there are being sponsored by Petrobras, which is one of the world's largest uh, oil companies now, Brazilian company. But this new world order brings a big question. Is it going to be a better world? Will the new masters in Shanghai and Mumbai and here in Brasilia and elsewhere be better at running the world than the old masters in New York and London and Tokyo and the rest? How will they treat their people? Now, the big hitters, they're not going to be all the same, I don't think. The big hitters like China and India and Brazil, the BRIC nations, as they're called, are basing their economic growth on building their own companies and using their own skills. It's internally generated economic growth. But there are disturbing signs that some others are trying to get rich quick by selling their natural resources to outsiders, not developing their own natural resources, but selling them to outsiders, whether they're Europeans or Chinese or whoever it is. In Africa especially, nations are surrendering economic and political control of their land and natural resources like minerals and forests and so on. They're giving in in the face of foreign exploitation. It's a, like, if you, if you like, an extractive economic system, a bit too like the old colonial era when Europeans ran the governments as well. The Europeans don't run the governments there, but they very often run the economy. So increasingly not the Europeans, but the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians and elsewhere. Some of them are selling to Western companies, but as I say, many of them are selling to other southern countries. Libya, for instance. That's a large project in Mali, the Mal-Libya project, an agricultural project that was being funded by the Libyans. So there are a lot of players out here playing the colonial role, if you like. So in Africa, there have been some spectacular increases in their economy, in their GDP. And a lot of people, and middle classes and upper classes, have got rich. There's a small elite in most of these countries. But the real problem is that few of those benefits are reaching down to the masses, particularly in rural areas. So fast growing income differences within far too many countries around the world. This is another global trend, increasing income differentials. And I don't believe it can go on without uh, revolt and chaos. Uh, there's going to have to be reform in these things. So fast growing, they call them lion economies now. Like Asia had the tiger economies, now Africa is talking about having lion economies. Countries like Mozambique and Guinea and Angola and Tanzania, and they're all seeing increasing poverty and inequality at the same time as their economies are growing. So there's something fundamental, fundamentally wrong and unfair about these societies. And that's going to have to be resolved if they're going to join in uh, the expansion um, and the growth of prosperity in the South. But part of this is happening because of what I think is a second new reality that in the world today that I want to concentrate on. 
That is about resource shortages. In the 21st century, metals and minerals and oil and chemicals, even food, are increasingly in short supply. And corporations, wherever they're from, increasingly they're from the, from the south, but it doesn't really make much difference, they are scrambling to control those resources. They don't want to just trade in them, they want to control the source of them. As a British think tank called Chatham House put it just a few months ago, quote, the specter of resource insecurity has come back in the world today with a vengeance. It's a new, another part of the new landscape, resource shortages and insecurity. Now the biggest concern right now for many people is food supplies. Big question, have we got enough land and perhaps enough water as well to feed the planet, to feed the seven, eight, we have seven billion people now, we'll go up to probably nine billion. And it's not just environmentalists who are asking those questions, it's financiers and bankers. Um, investment strategist called Jeremy Grantham, quite influential on the, on the sort of bankery financier circuit, warns of a growing food and water scarcities linked to climate change and the unpredictable weather that comes with it over the next several decades. We are, Grantham says, quote, five years into a severe global food crisis. In future, he predicts, resource squabbles and waves of food-induced migration, environmental refugees, if you like, will threaten global stability. A lot of people think like that, and in the short term, at any rate, there's a lot to be said for that argument. We can see some of the politics playing out now in terms of these resource conflicts. Excuse me. That's him. Um, this guy is in Tahrir Square in Cairo. He's wearing what they called at the time a bread helmet. Well, you can see it's a loaf of bread somewhat by his right ear. Um, these bread helmets were a common sight during the Arab Spring a couple of years ago, not just in Cairo, but also in Tunis um, during the revolution of 2011. We now think of those demonstrations as being about democracy and about getting rid of old tyrants. And well, they were, but they were also initially about food prices, about bread prices. People were often on the streets complaining about, there were bread rights in a way. And bread rights, as historians among you will know, has been a catalyst throughout history, from the French Revolution to the American Civil War, and now it seems on into the Arab Spring. They bring down governments. Governments are fearful when food prices rise. And since 2008, those fears have grown as grain prices around the world have grown, risen spectacularly. Uh, they're going, after a long period, about 30, 30 years of stable and falling food prices, they're suddenly doubling in a couple of months and then sometimes they come back down and then they go up again and they're on a rise again right now. We have suddenly very unstable food prices. And that's just a graph of where we've been going on from 1980 uh, on the left through to pretty much now. And you can see generally low food prices. Suddenly we're getting these huge peaks. And those, those are the moments when many governments get destabilized. The price of a loaf of bread tripled in Egypt prior to the downfall of Mubarak in 2011. And they're on the surge again right now. Globally, now think about this. I mean, it may not matter too much to us or many of us here, but globally, a billion people spend most of their income on food. So if food prices double, kind of thing going on on that graph, if food prices double, they starve. Or they take to the streets and protest about it and bring down governments. That's just a demonstration going on, on in Argentina. I don't think it even made the news here in Europe, but it was a big thing. Bread rights change things, and we could see a lot of bread rights in future as resource constraints, make food prices unstable. Big new uncertainty. This guy is John Beddington, until recently Britain's British government's chief scientist, a sober-minded scientist, not given to hyperbole. But he recently was saying, we are at a unique moment in history, he said. After a century 
of declining commodity prices, including food prices, they are now soaring, he said, up 70% in the last decade, all kinds of commodity prices, but with food crops to the fore. And he talks about a perfect storm, is how he describes it, coming in the next 20 years, in which combination of climate change, rising world population, land and water shortages are going to create an escalating food crisis in which hundreds of millions of people, he says, could starve. And there are going to be battles around the world over land and water and other resources. And this is not some kind of wild-eyed environmentalist. This is the chief scientist of the British government talking here. Well, I, I'm going to be revisionist about that prediction. But we have, we have been here before. Excuse me. Um, yeah, that's the one I want. Um, last year, I published this book on land grabs. Um, as mentioned in the introduction. Um, and it's about how countries like Saudi Arabia and China and South Korea and many others are scouring the world looking for cheap land in order to grow food for their people to prevent bread riots back home. And it's also about how investors in Wall Street and Beijing and Delhi and London and elsewhere are following, they too are trying to buy up land. It all took off when the food prices soared in 2008. It's very clear what the reason was. People are speculating in food and the land that can grow food. Land is a hot commodity now. George Soros, um, famous, one of the world's most famous investors, a lot of people follow what he says, said recently, I'm convinced that farmland is going to be one of the best investments of our time. And he's buying personally in Brazil and elsewhere. And there are a lot of people following what he does and says. Um, his words echo perhaps those of Mark Twain 150 years ago in the US when he said rather prophetically, buy land, they're not making it anymore. And you can kind of see the logic, you know. I mean, you know, there is only so much land. And if we're more and more of us and food is in short supply, buy land. It looks like a good deal. So a lot of people are doing this. The scale of recent land grabs by governments and agribusiness corporations of these kind of investors is staggering. By one estimate, more than 200 million hectares has changed hands. I can't imagine that number, but it's an area the size of Britain, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and the Benelux countries all combined, the amount of land that's changed hands in the last few years. A lot of it, uh-uh, come on George, that's it, yeah, a lot of it is in that yellow area there on the map in Africa, the savanna grasslands of Africa, between the rainforests and the deserts. Much of it is not fenced, it's pastoral land, but it's land that's used. The World Bank calls this zone, quote, zone, quote, the world's last large reserve of underused land. Note that phrase, underused land. Maybe under, underused, but half a billion people live in that area. Many of them are getting very angry with the land grabbers coming in and taking their land. They're complaining about that. There's going to be political trouble over that. And this is what happens when resources are in short supply, when there are resource crises. The rich, the investors, grab those resources, try to make more money out of them, speculating in something in short supply. I'm going to talk more in one of the working groups about land grabs uh, tomorrow. I think it's a fascinating topic. But there's a parallel concern. I'll move on from that now. But there's a parallel concern about water supplies. After all, land is not much use without water for agriculture. And this if I can get to it, is another co cover of another of my books, uh, When the Rivers Run Dry. The world's greatest rivers, many of them are running on empty now because we are taking all their water, mostly for growing food. Among them, the Nile through Egypt, the Indus in Pakistan, the Colorado in the US, the Yellow River in China, all of them no longer reach the sea for much of the time. All the water is taken. Less visible is the loss of underground water reserves. And I find this scarier. At least after all, in a river, the rains will eventually renew the flows. You know, the next rainy season, the river will be flowing again, even if we took it all this time. They're a renewable resource, albeit often heavily overused. But underground water reserves are often being lost 
forever. To ensure food security today, we're sacrificing food security tomorrow, using up the water that we'd need tomorrow. Take India. On the face of it, a huge agricultural success story. Half a century ago, India suffered regular famines. Now, thanks to new high-yield crop varieties, what we call the Green Revolution, it's a billion people feed themselves today. But those crops are extremely thirsty and increasingly reliant on underground water. Huge amounts of water are being pumped out, um, such as just, this is just, just a pump in Bengal in eastern India, pumped out from underground to keep those crops growing. Tens of millions of Indian farmers are buying Chinese uh, water pumps, uh, cheap pumps, uh, in order to keep that water pumping, to keep it going, to keep their crops going. One estimate is that they over-pump their water reserves by, this is a st difficult statistic, but 100 cubic kilometers a year. Now, I find that difficult, but a cubic kilometer feels like a lot of water. They are over-pumping, pumping down their underground water reserves in India by 100 cubic kilometers a year. The practical effect of that, that's a step well in um, Gujarat, I think. 20 years ago, you could pull water out of that well. You can see the steps, you could walk down, but you pull out the water with a bucket on a rope. Now, you'd have to go, you have to go down a mile, kilometer and a half, okay, in order to find the water. That's how badly things are going. Saudi Arabia has pumped out all its underground water reserves. Um, all this is scary. A lot of things going on here. But actually, I'm going to move on to the... I'm, a, I'm running a bit behind, but um, I want to get to my optimistic point because I'm actually optimistic about what we can do about some of these scary uh, resource shortages. That's a book from 40 years ago. When I was young, we had a book, Paul, Paul Ehrlich's famous book, The Population Bomb, in which he predicted that basically the battle to feed the world was over and lots of people were going to die. We, we, you know, we have some of that language again now. Didn't happen. Science delivered. Food production doubled ahead of a doubling in the world's population. That's an example, perhaps a simple one, of how science and technology can transform um, the way that we live uh, on the world. And I think um, I'll, I'll skip through him. We can uh, increase our water use uh, our, our efficiency with which we use water. We can double the efficiency with which we use water um, and get through... Uh, well, we can feed 10 billion people on this planet with the water that we have on the land that we had if we do things much more efficiently. Let me move on to a final basic point here that I want to get to about the population bomb that Paul Ehrlich mentioned. We are defusing the population bomb. A lot of people think population is the, the ultimate reason why we can't safely live on this earth. There are just too many of us. Fact is, women today are having half as many children as their grandmothers did. Two and a half compared to five a generation ago. That's the global average. In much of the world, it's even less than that. Um, that's a map that I won't go into for, from my last book. The light areas on that map, roughly half the world are areas where the fertility rate, the number of children that women have, is, a, is less than they need to replace their population, below two children per woman, essentially. Now, that's not true everywhere. There's parts of Africa where there are still large families are still the norm. But I saw a statistic the other day. We have reached peak child. That means from now on, Fertility rates have come down so far that there are going to be fewer children in the world every year. Doesn't mean the world's population is going to start falling yet, but the number of children is starting to fall. The population bomb looks like it was a temporary phenomenon while people got used to the fact that modern technology allowed most kids to grow up. So now we're having much smaller families because we realize we, uh, we can get away with that. You know, you only have to produce two children to reproduce the next generation, not five or six anymore, because most children get to grow up. I think by mid-century, 
we're going to have peak population on this planet. Population isn't going to go on and up like that. It's starting to level off. And probably by the second half of this century, population around the world will be falling. Now, that doesn't solve all our problems. It doesn't resolve our resource crisis. But it does give us a chance to solve them, because then population numbers that would doom all our efforts are not going to carry on. We can look forward to stable population, and that's the point at which we can seriously start to fix some of the really big problems that we have about climate change and the environment and running out of resources and feeding the world and so on. Um, 20th century was a unique century. This is just my favorite picture of a rickshaw rider in, in uh, Manila. It, it kind of sums up something for me. 20th century was a century of youth and vigor and growth and economic short-termism and crazy stuff of all sorts and speculation. It turned out to be unsustainable grabbing of the world's resources. It was great fun, but I think it was a one-off. The 21st century is going to be very different. It's going to be a society in which we're aging, and aging quite fast. Aging is the big demographic thing happening in the 20th century, not population growth anymore, because we're living longer and we're having many fewer children. The human race, for the first time in its history, Homo sapiens is going to be mainly old people. Now, I hate to say this to you, an audience of the young, but you guys are going to get old too, so you know, get used to the idea. Um, but I think our culture and our expectations and the way that we treat the world is going to change as a result of that. Really fundamentally, when the average age is sort of 45 or 50 rather than as it is now, just in its 20s, it's going to change the way that we as a species treat the world. It could, we could, it could be a real disaster, or you know, an entire global retirement home, and you know, we'd all kind of curl up and die. But um, I'm optimistic. I think we're going to be wiser in the way that we deal with each other. We're not going to go to war so often. You notice how most of the world, we haven't had any world wars for quite a while now. Most of the wars that still happen are in countries that are very young. Older people seem to go to war less. Well, it's, you know, they're not really up for it anymore, so you know, it's logical. Um, I think we're going to be wiser in our use of resources and the way that we manage our planet. I hope so, because we have to. We have no choice. We're running out of resources. We can't do it anymore the way we've done it in the past. So as I say, I'm an, opti I'm an optimist about technology, but also about people. I think we can take the right path, the path we have to take. And if we do, I believe it will be in large part because we've learned to be older, wiser, and greener. I could put it another way. I could say that my generation has screwed up spectacularly, big time. We've trashed the planet. There is no getting away from it. <laughs> you guys, I'm hoping that you can do better. Because by the time you are getting old, by the second half of the century, if we haven't fixed these resource crises, it'll be too late. And we really will have billions of people dying of starvation and the whole world will be like the West fears that it might be becoming now of declining economic activity. The whole world could be old and poor and destitute. If we're going to ignore that, no pressure, but <laughs> you guys are our last chance. Thank you. Pierce, thank you very much for a great talk. Our next speaker is a Spanish slash French activist and, and or a member of the International Organization for a Participatory Society. Please welcome David Martin. Thank you. <laughs> I was told there were uh, <clears throat> a few foreigners in the house. Is that true? Is that true? So uh, by a round of applause, how many foreigners are like me wearing their pajamas underneath right now?
It's cold, isn't it? Well, uh, Fred has given a great presentation, and I would like to thank him for it. Uh, I think my talk will complete his. He's been giving his analysis of how things are around today in one aspect of things, and I would like to uh, bring the subject a little bit further into the future by talking about something called participatory economics, which uh, hopefully will uh, intrigue you enough. Uh, I don't know if there, are in, if there are any manuals on how to give talks to uh, young audiences or uh, leftist audiences or whatever it is that you like, but I'm pretty sure that it says in room number one, don't start your presentation with a quote from a famous Nazi leader, <laughs> like I'm about to do. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll see that there's a link somewhere, and you'll forgive me, and you'll probably understand my point. <laughs> uh, have you ever heard this say from, um, when I hear the world culture, I reach for my gun? You've heard that say? It was from J Joseph Goebbels. He, he was quoting somebody else, but who cares? Uh, uh, my point is that, well, many of us, when we hear the word economics, well, we feel the same way. We maybe not be reaching for our guns, but maybe we're reaching for our wallets. Uh, when we read the newspapers, uh, some of us, we skip the economy pages. Some of us only read the headlines, and some of us, or most of us, will get allergic reactions when you hear words such as uh, CDO or FDI, WTO, or... Uh, IMF, LIBOR, comparative advantage, absolute advantage, inflation, deflation, appreciation, <laughs> depreciation, reflation, stagflation, you name it, flation, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, you hear those words and you immediately reach for your wallet. I mean, if I ask people from the university here in Trondheim, the Science and Technology University, to come and give us a lecture about climate change, about astronomy, about even about quantum physics. I'm sure that in, a, in about a couple of hours, uh, they would probably give us the basic, mm, basic facts of what it is they're working on, and we would get a pretty good picture of it. Um, I believe that the basic facts of the economy should be uh, understood just as easily by everyone, because um, talking about the economy is talking about it's talking about us, and at some level we should be able to discuss it without too many unnecessary technicalities. Uh, and why? Well, it's, the reason is easy, because we, when we deal, we deal with economics on a daily basis. When we work, when we produce, when we team up on a project, when we ask for a raise, when we compare paychecks, when we're not happy with, uh, with our situations, when we, uh, when we consume, when we fill cars with gasoline, when we, when we go to the park, believe it or not, when you're taking a walk in the park, you're actually doing an economic act. You're a consumer of a public good, so that's part of the economy as well. Uh, when you find that there are no buses near where you live because you live in the countryside, that's also an economic act because you're, you're a frustrated con uh, consumer. Your preferences were not taken into account. Uh, when we care about climate change or when we care about the scarce resources, we're part of the economy. So if we're part of the economy, how come and when we hear uh, most economists talk about economics, we feel excluded. Uh, we feel immediately excluded from the conversation, even though we suffer the consequences. Sorry. Even when, even when, even when we suffer, that we are the ones suffering the consequences from uh, bad decision making in economics. That is, except of course, if you're uh, an economist. Uh, when you're an economist, you can be 100% wrong all of the time, and proven wrong, and still can keep your job or get promoted even. <laughs> we not only suffer the consequences, but we also witness uh, what's being done to others. We witness the inequality, we witness the, the, um, the unemployment and the psychological damage made on workers. Uh, we, we are witnessing right now, maybe not so much in Norway, but at least in the rest of, the, of Europe, where I come from, a huge upward redistribution distribution of wealth uh, in other words, we are the actors and the witnesses of markets and of capitalism. And when we have had enough, when we get pissed off, when we protest, we go and explain why we protest. And we're very uh, graphic about it, very detailed about it. And we go to the last detail in explaining why markets are bad. 
why capitalism is bad. But the problem is that sooner or later, uh, even after we have proven we're right to our listener, uh, even after we've uh, talked about everything we don't like capitalism for, we are asked, okay, we know what you're against, but what are you for? You know, you're against capitalism, but what are you for? Or if you were uh, uh, old enough to have known communist Russia or one of those countries, which is not the case, obviously, uh, you would be asked the same thing. I mean, we know you're against um, central planification or the ghost plan, what it is that you're for, same thing. Uh, what is our reply when, when we say we're against capitalism and they say, okay, but what are you for? Well, our reply is that we tell them some more about how much, it's, how much it sucks. We tell them, uh, we talk about labor exploitation, we talk about austerity, marketing, we talk about financial industry, about some more about markets, we talk about uh, uh, Rajoy in Spain, BP, the uh, spilling oil, Obama, then we just name all the American presidents from uh, Reagan to Bush, W. Bush, Clinton. We know everything about it. We're like talking, walking, talking Wikipedias on every subject that's, that describes how much capitalism sucks. And, <laughs> and we're right. Nobody says that we are wrong. But we are talking to someone who's already convinced. We're talking to someone who already knows what we're talking about. In fact, we go on and on and on and on until, they're, you know, until their ears start bleeding or something. And they say, but please, we know what you're against, but what are you for? In fact, by not offering an alternative to uh, capitalism or central planification, even though I'll emphasize more capitalism than I will central planification because we live in capitalism, uh, when we don't offer an alternative, aren't we reinforcing the old conservatives, say, from uh, your, former prime, your former prime minister, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who said there is no alternative? There is no alternative. Tina. And the, the, the dangerous thing is that more and more people on the left now are adopting this uh, idea that there is no alternative and the markets are just given. To illustrate this, just uh, Allow me to give you another quote, perhaps a better choice this time, by a great, um, <clears throat> by a great economist, German or Keynes. Uh, this morning, some of you heard me uh, reading this quote. He said that capitalism is not a success. It is not intelligent, and it's not beautiful. It is not just, and it's not virtuous. And it doesn't deliver the goods. In short, we dislike it. Some of us, we even, we even hate it and we are beginning to despise it. But when we wonder what to put in its place, and this is what he says, we are extremely perplexed. Indeed, we don't seem to be so confident about what it is that we do want. We know about economic injustice, and we know a great deal about it. But what can we say about economic justice? Not injustice, what can we say about economic justice? when we wonder what to put in its place, we are extremely perplexed. Well, let's try and overcome perplexity, even if, if I don't have much time, according to what it says here. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting. <laughs> I want to talk to you about participatory economics. And, um, and I really want to make this point that another economy is possible, not to convince you, but at least to intrigue you. That's my point. Uh, so, so let's talk about economic justice for a second. Let's take remuneration, which means where do you get your income from and what your income should be and how it should relate to your, uh, uh, to your activity. My question is, what should be the norm? Well, the norm right now in capitalism is the following. To each according to the value of the contribution of your physical or human capital. Maybe that sounds a little technical, but it's not it's so difficult to comprehend. Physical capital means, it doesn't mean that the shirt that you own or the scarf that you own, it doesn't mean the house, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean your, your car or the cash money you carry in your pocket. It means, uh, it means the stocks, it means the machines, the intellectual property, the resources, the oil, uh, the resources that uh, Fred spoke about. It means wood or woods, it means the labs, the factories, you get the point. So my question is, is it morally defendable that 
if you are, to take one example, and this is a bit of a caricature, but I have to make caricatures when I only have 10 minutes left. Uh, is, it, is it more like defendable that when you're the son or the grandson of a Rockefeller, you never have to work a day in, in your life? Is it more like defendable that you get 100 times the basic income every month without ever having to do anything? Well, I guess not. I don't know what your answer is, but my answer is not. How about human capital? It means, human capital means your talents, your skills, basically how much you contribute uh, to the output, okay? So if you're chopping wood, it means how much wood you can chop uh, in a week. If you're a doctor, if you're, sorry, if you're an actor, it means how many people will come and watch your movies. If, you, uh, if you're David Beckham, it means how many shirts you can sell. If you're a researcher, it means, or underwear, I don't know. Uh, well, if you're a researcher, it means uh, um, uh, the, the new wealth that your invention or your, uh, your, what, the, the produce of what you invented, is going, how much is going to contribute to either the wealth or the well-being of society. Uh, does it make sense that someone who works on an idea for a month or even five years, uh, as brilliant as the idea might be, and I'm not despising what is being, what the contribution is. I'm talking about the moral value of remuneration. Remember that. But does it make sense that a person who works maybe a month or five years, depending if you're Mark Zuckerberg or someone more anonymous, uh, that he makes as much as 10 families working day in, day out for 900 years? Does it make sense to you? Doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense that your income should depend on whether uh, there are 1,000 people using your idea or maybe 10,000 or 100,000? or maybe pure luck? Does it, does it make sense that it should depend on pure luck? Uh, what, if you're, what if you work the land? What if you work the land? Should it depend on the weather? Can you defend that? If you work the same hours than I, than I do, uh, if you work under the same sun as I do, as hard as I do, but don't contribute as much as I do, just due to innate physical differences, I'm like a camel drinking, my God. Is it? Is it more like defendable that, uh, that you should get paid less just because you got less than me, just because you, you contributed less? Can you defend that? Would you rather defend it on grounds that maybe uh, those are necessary incentives that um, we may not like it but morally, but it makes sense economically because it creates incentives? I mean, I'm not going to go into this, but do we still think at this point uh, with all the literature that is out there, do we still think that you need to pay nice jobs with lots of money? That unless that you do that, no one will want to work in an air-conditioned office. Does it, does, does it still make sense at this point? Does it make sense that unless you do, no one will want to work in the nice places? No one will want to be a doctor? No one will want to be an economist unless you pay them huge amounts? If a job requires more effort and more sacrifices, like say, if, let's take an extreme example, you're working on a coal mine. Doesn't it make sense, <clears throat> doesn't it make more sense to incentivate or compensate it with higher income? I don't know what your, uh, I don't know what your answers to those questions were, and we could discuss some of those points later in more detail if you like, but I don't find any of the four mentions morally defendable. I do not think that property nor bargaining, bargaining power uh, uh, should determine what it says on your pay. However, I do value work. I do value the sacrifices that people have to make in order to produce the things that we want. I don't think that remuneration should depend on how much your property contributes to the economy. And I don't think that income should depend on how much you contribute by virtue of your talents or your skills. I think it is not morally defendable, and it doesn't make sense economically either. I'm not, I'm not claiming I just proved it. I'm just, I, just want, I just want to ask that question. It is not necessary pain that we must accept. It is not a necessary pain that we must accept in order to get the things that we want from the economy, from a modern economy. Uh, so indeed, like Thatcher, unlike Thatcher, what a lapsus, uh, unlike Thatcher, I do think that there is an alternative. So I am in favor of a, no a third norm instead, which is uh, to each according to effort and sacrifice. It means that if I work more, if I work longer hours and the more duress, I will get more. 
Some of those differences are quantitative. I, I, maybe I work 60 hours instead of my colleagues who work only 40. Sometimes these differences in income will be due to qualitative differences. Maybe I work in the uh, harder conditions. Maybe it's uh, the air that you breathe, which is not as nice. Maybe it's just because you have to work on Christmas Day or on Sundays. Um, this is what economic justice is for me. And this is the kind of economic justice that participatory economy suggests. And I think it is, in that respect, in the remunerative ex uh, as aspect, it is a viable alternative to both capitalism and to central planification. So this idea of economic justice that, let's call it equities, so we don't confuse things, because economic justice, we tend to put a bit of everything. That's one of the pillars of Paracon. It means it's one of our economic values. But there are other values, in fact. Uh, I have very little time to, <laughs> to introduce you to Paracon. I'll just say a few words about these economic values. And then I'll try to introduce you to the main institutional commitments of a participatory economic economy. So I have already spoken about equity. So I, I'm not gonna, gonna dwell on that. How about economic democracy? It's another term that's being used. We all want that. However, when it comes to define it, uh, maybe some of us are a little bit perplexed. Uh, mostly, if some of you have been in the position like I have, where you have been in assemblies, in workers' assemblies, in, in gatherings, in, in movements, social movements, like the ones we had in Spain, uh, it really puts your uh, beliefs into questions. Uh, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what according to me, economic democracy means, and that's what, according to Paricon as well. So what should be the norm for our decision-making uh, decision process? I mean, whether we are a workers' council, or a consumers' council, or a neighborhood council, or an assembly, we have to make decisions, don't we? So in mainstream economics, uh, people talk about something called economic freedom. Sorry, yes, economic freedom, it means uh, if you own more, you have more freedom. If you have more capital, you have more freedom. That's basically the, the, the moral foundation for uh, uh, capitalism and freedom by Milton Friedman. Uh, those of you who study economics might know who he, is, who he was. Uh, so maybe in an imaginary world with endless space and endless resources, and I think we've heard Fred talk about how this is not the case, you could have a point and speak about economic freedom, but in the real world, uh, the way Milton Friedman uh, talks about economic freedom doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, in the real world, the extension of my freedom is always at the expense of somebody else's freedom. If I get more of something, it means somebody else is getting less of it. Of it. If I want to bequeath, it means if I want to leave to my children when I die, if I want to leave them one million euros because I've just worked very hard on it, like it or not, compromising, it's, it will be compromising the freedom or the right to equal opportunities for future generations. I'm not going to dwell on that either since I have about 50 seconds left. I'm going to cheat, by the way, just so you know. So, um, if property no longer determines who calls the shots, who can vote, who makes decisions, then how should decisions be made? Uh, should, should the workers decide? Should, be the, should it be the entire country for every uh, decision? Should it, be, should it be majority rule plus one vote? Should it be consensus, like it has been in some social movements? Mm, well, let me ask you the question differently when it comes to decision making. You, uh, you have decided to wear those shoes today, right? You didn't... Nobody put those shoes for you, I guess. Uh, if I ask you, who did you consult about it? Of course, it's a ridiculous question. The answer is nobody. I, I learned not to ask this question to people who have good sense of humor. So they say, my mother, or something like that. So you are at the office at work, and you decide to put up a picture of your dog. This is a different situation. You're at work now. You decide to put a picture of your dog uh, on your desk. And some colleague of yours comes and says, hey, I don't like that. Just, I don't like uh, you having a picture of your dog on your desk. There's only two possible answers you can give that person. 
one is man your business and the other one is man your effing business, right? <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> Excusez mon français. Indeed, who should make that decision? You should make that decision, like a dictator. You don't like hearing the word dictator in something I'm advocating for, but it is like that. When you decide to put your shoes, you don't, you don't, don't have to ask for anyone. However, same situation now, time is up. You decide to bring loudspeakers at work because you just uh, bought them on uh, Amazon and you can't wait to, to try to see how they work. So you decide, so you plug them in, you log on to Spotify, and you turn the music on very loud. And the music, it's, uh, I don't know, some group. Let's say it's One Direction. <laughs> so it's awful. <laughs> People start convulsing and vomiting, and one of your colleagues jumps out of the window. The question is, who should make that decision? Sorry for One Direction finds out there. So who should make that decision of playing music very loud while at work? Obviously, all of those who are affected by <clears throat> the decision that you just made, uh, whether it's that group or another group, is pointless. So uh, sometimes it makes sense that you should make decisions all by yourself, like a dictator. And sometimes it makes sense to make decisions by consensus. And sometimes it, make, it should be majority rule plus one vote. Uh, just take a, a more realistic example. Let's say you're voting on the agenda or working schedule. Uh, so when you think about it, it actually makes sense. It makes sense to me, at least. Of course, in some cases, you, won't, you will never achieve what we call self-management. That's one of the values. It is not always as easy and straightforward as the rather silly examples I just gave, but I was just making a caricature. But you get the, you, you, you get the point, I guess. And for this reason, I don't like using the term uh, economic democracy. Rather, I use, as I said, the term self-management. So, very quickly, the other values are solidarity, which is defined as the concern for the well-being of others, while not, uh, uh, which is a value that needs not to sacrifice either efficiency nor diversity. Um, those are two um, economic values also I, I want to emphasize, but I'm going to skip ahead a little. Um, so we have equity, self-management, solidarity, and now we have also diversity. But diversity is something very important to me. Um, if you look at the 1950s science fiction movies where they all dress the same and they all have the same haircut in those black and white movies and they imagine that the year 2013 we will all be dressed in blue or white and we'll just, uh, no one wants that, right? <laughs> Do you want that? I don't. Uh, it's not exactly my idea of the future and I guess we enjoy, we enjoy being surrounded by people that can do certain things that we cannot do. Finally, the last value is classlessness, but since I'm going to be talking about classlessness when I talk about the Workers' Council, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna forward a little. So what are the institutional commitments of a Paricon? So in a, I want to talk about workers' councils. You know, participatory economy production is carried out by workers' councils where each member has one vote. Everyone is free to apply for more membership in the council uh, of her choice, of his or her choice, or form a new council uh, with whomever that person wishes, which is to me a way to promote a value that is usually uh, monopolized by conservatives, which, which is freedom of enterprise. Uh, Ironically, I don't think I'm not going to uh, make a digression about that, but uh, they monopolize that term uh, freedom of enterprise, but I think what they advocate for is exactly the opposite. So I have made the choice for this presentation not to insist on the benefits or efficiency gains of self-management or employee management, because I think there is ample literature out there that can prove it. In fact, I even found books at the airport bookshops, so it means it's probably already part of the mainstream, that idea, at least. Uh, I have also spoken already about what self-management self means in terms of decision-making, and I said we are, decision-making should be to the degree uh, that one is affected by a decision. So I would like instead to talk about something a bit more controversial, which is balanced job complexes. 
So even if you cut me because I'm exceeding my time, at least I would like to make that point, which is balanced job complexes. The thing is that every work, sorry, every economy organizes work around jobs. What we understand as jobs is a bundle of tasks uh, that you can summarize in a list of maybe six or seven things. And uh, in the economy as we know it today, the large majority of jobs, let's just say it's roughly 80%, they contain a, a number of similar, relatively undesirable, and relatively unempowering tasks. While a few jobs, uh, they contain a number of the opposite, of relatively desirable and empowering tasks. But my question is, why should some people work lives be less desirable than others? Doesn't taking equity uh, seriously require balancing work for desirability? And why should work empower a few while disempowering most? And this is a very important point that you can see in action. You don't need to wait for the future to happen. You can see that in action in, uh, in certain factories that have been taken over by workers where you see that they have uh, done everything I've just spoke about so far except for balance job, balancing the jobs, balancing the tasks. And what you see is that first meeting, everyone is very excited about it. Second meeting, uh, you have uh, maybe tw roughly 20% who start talking about actual stuff, uh, decisions that need to be made. Third meeting, little by little, they start dominating the debate. And meeting after meeting, and by the end, it's roughly the 20% who stay and the 80% who just prefer to stay at home because they feel that the people uh, during those meetings, they don't even speak the same language and they don't, um, and they don't, feel, they don't feel concerned. They don't feel concerned about what's being talked about. Yeah. How much? Over? <laughs> So balance job complex, it's, it's important to me, important to, for <coughs> understanding participatory economics. Another institutional commitment is consumers' councils, which we can talk about later, and then participatory planning, which means uh, that cons both councils will, it, it's essentially it's replacing market, so both uh, councils will arrive at a price, at a fair price, by including, integrating external costs into the price. It's a huge, huge uh, summary, but I'm uh, limited by time. Thank you very much. I don't think I, I had time to convince you, but I, I'm very much looking forward to hear your questions later on. And if you're not in convinced enough, then just think that Paracon will improve your sex lives, okay? Okay, um, welcome back, everyone. We are now ready for a Q&A session. We have a quite a long list of questions. So I ask you to please keep your questions short and your answers as well. Um, at first, I have uh, a few questions. Um, you asked me during the dinner for uh, uh, concrete, uh, short questions. I will not give you that. Um, say that you were elected president of the global government tomorrow. What is the top three changes that you would initiate first? <laughs> Marty, would you start? This is exactly why I hate job interviews. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you see yourself five years from now? <laughs> um, three main changes. Uh, first of all, if I'm president of the world, I would say don't vote for me. I would say organize. Organize, because I think that uh, it's, time, it's about time that, that we change the politics from uh, top-down politics to bottom-up politics in a way that it's effective and democratic. And uh, following the, some, some of the principles I just mentioned before. The three changes would be, I think, I don't know if there are changes, but three priorities would be um, the ones that are threatening our survival uh, it will be our, uh, increasing our concern for uh, climate change, be making it our first priority. 
because we're talking about the end of uh, everything. We're not even talking about Paricon or we're talking about the end of us. The second thing that's threatening our survival is a nuclear threat. I mean, I don't know if you look around some of the countries that have uh, nuclear um, arsenals. It's pretty scary. Yeah, and the it's U.S. And the, uh, yeah, that will, that, will be, that will be, of course, the, the, the first one. Um, and the third one, uh, I don't know. I'll leave it open to them to, to say what the third one is. Okay, thank you. Fred Pierce. Uh, yeah, I think democracy is the key to this. Um, I, I really don't believe that leaders, whether they're me or anybody else, um, are going to solve these problems. I really believe that only people, people power, uh, can solve the world's problems. Mostly leaders screw up. They're actually very weak. I think it's the other thing that you learn about. They, they, they sort of respond to whatever forces are uh, uh, kind of pressing on them. And sometimes, very often, that's industrial lobbyists. And sometimes, on a good day, it's, it's democratic forces. But I'm, I, I can't really stand this up with statistics or facts or anything. But my gut feeling is that only more democracy will deliver the kind of changes that, that we've both been talking about. Thank you. Uh, one more thing, David Marti. Uh, the model of participatory economics that you uh, explained to us during your presentation, uh, it's representing an uh, alternative to the economic systems that we already are aware of, uh, capitalism, and on the other side, uh, communism. Uh, but I'm curious, what do you, um, and, and the theory sounds very appealing, and I guess a lot of you in the audience would agree with me on that one. But I'm curious, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenges when it comes to implementing this system in the real world? The biggest challenge, challenges into implementing it is to having enough people to, to actually make it work. I mean, once you believe in it, I'm really not expecting that anyone in the audience will be convinced by the short presentation that I gave. That I gave. And if anyone is convinced, then I'm seriously worried about the f our future because it means you're completely irrational people. By now, you should be intrigued and you should be wondering what it is that I just spoke about and want to know more and ask questions for yourself, trying to find literature, ask me the questions you can ask me today, and, and so on and so on. The, the main challenge is to ha get enough people to build movements that are follow the participatory uh, principles. But first of all, you have to convince yourself and you have to be uh, uh, rational beings. You have to be critical and you have to be, I mean, every question that you're going to ask me tonight is going to be justified and you should ask it. Uh, Pierce, uh, what do you think we as students can do to uh, help achieve a more sustainable and fair global economy? Be good citizens. I mean, it's, sorry, it's... Uh, uh, it, just kind of try and look at the world through open eyes and try and think about it because nobody else is going to fix these things, as I say, unless it's, unless it's uh, aware citizens uh, taking power to themselves and insisting that some of the really big issues are solved, whether we're talking about climate change, resource conflicts. I agree with you about nuclear issues. We've rather forgotten about this. I mean, I was brought up at a time when, uh, you know, the Cold War and, you know, the, the bombs were around. I actually remember a day when I was, I don't know, I must have been 11 years old and the Cuban Missile Crisis was going on. And I, physic I went to school one day and my father told me before I left school, if you see a mushroom cloud in the sky, get under the school desk. I mean, it really was, there was one day when the world might have blown up. We kind of forget about that, that we, for a long time the world lived under that, under that nuclear kind of cloud. Uh, and it hasn't entirely gone away. You know, the issues are still there. Maybe, but maybe climate change and things like that are, are bigger issues. But, sorry, I'm coming back to the point that I made before. We've got to be aware, intelligent citizens insisting that, the leaders do what uh, the people want. Thank you. Uh, the first one to ask a question is Oscar Kiuros. Sorry for my pronunciation. And uh, Martin Gamboa can get ready. Oscar? 
Yeah, you can come here. Um, Mr. Pierce, acknowledging that resources are unequally distributed between the population is what brought me, what brought us to Trondheim this February. You said that Latin American and African countries experience big economical growth. I believe it's a growth that is in little hands. You know, the hunger of big national and international companies for wealth and power has reached big extremes in countries such as Honduras. You know, overexploitation and pollution of our land, resources that should be for all. You know, the murder of our people. Our country seems to be for sale. I once talked to this young activist, Honduras activist, and he, he told me, an armed revolution is becoming necessary. I struggle to accept such, a, such an idea, but when I see Honduran kids begging for food in front of a, of a huge Buga King in the middle of Tegucigalpa, I can only think, maybe somebody should put a bomb in the Congress. Kill those motherfuckers. Excuse me for... <laughs> this is a way of thinking that is very well spread between Honduran and, I think, developing countries' young activists. What would be your advice for the, uh, for the youth in times in which peaceful and bureaucratic uh, procedures seems to take just too much time, a time our land, our world can no longer afford? Thank you. Yeah, I said some kind of optimistic things about Latin America in general because there is more, formally speaking, democracy than there was. Uh, I remember the time when most of Latin America was still run by, uh, by generals and highly corrupt military people. Now, I'm not saying everything's perfect now, and I've been to Honduras, and I know there are big problems there. I was there just after Hurricane Mitch a few years ago when everything was in chaos. Um, but I do believe that there is progress being made and in countries like Brazil particularly and even in Colombia now, there are democratic forces at work. And they don't necessarily have control yet and the forces of international capitalism on even large countries like Brazil are still very strong and they're much, even much, they're much greater on smaller countries that have less ability to control their, uh, their, their, their economies and their national destinies. But I think there are good forces at work, and what I would say is work with them. Now, that doesn't, you know, that, that includes being active citizens and demonstrating and protesting about environmental issues and social issues. And it means democracy in the very widest sense, not just democracy about turning up to uh, tick a box at election time. We've all got to be very active citizens. But I do think there are hopeful signs um, in Latin America, same as there are hopeful signs in some part of Asia, parts of Asia, and even increasingly in Africa. And I'm, if, if one is being an optimist about, and an activist in the sense of really wanting to make change, we've got to grab hold of that stuff. We've got to use our power as citizens. Governments and even corporations are very vulnerable to uh, uh, being, uh, being attacked by citizens' groups and having their reputations undermined by citizens' groups, uh, sometimes even by consumer groups. We've got to use all the power that we have to try and hold the, the big forces that seem to determine so many of our lives to account. I was talking to somebody a little bit earlier about what I thought about capitalism. Um, and capital, we're often sort of people pretend that capitalism is a kind of force of nature and market forces, you can't do anything about market forces. That they are kind of, as I say, a kind of almost law of nature. Capitalism is, a, you know, market forces aren't a law of nature. They are something invented by humans. Um, the whole capitalist system is a rather artificial invention designed to promote economic growth. And if it works, that's fine. And if it doesn't work, we can change it. But it's not a law of nature. 
Um, and I think as citizens, we have to uh, uh, make that point too. We are in charge, and we've got to try and assert that. It's hard, but we've got to do it. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it is a lifetime's work. Thank you. Uh, next is Martin Gamboa and Jonas Kuixi. Make it ready. Uh, good night. Uh, Mr. Martin, you said something that is not fair for you, that a people could want millions of dollars for an idea, or that people should work five years and get millions of dollars and don't work anymore. And basically you said that the salary should be established and how many hours you work, the longer you work, the more you should gain. But then where productivity stands? Sorry? So, but then where productivity stands? Wouldn't what you mentioned cause negative incentive for people to work less? Uh, the, the people who uh, invent things will invent because they won't uh, get the money for, for their invention. Wouldn't this, be, wouldn't this uh, elevate the cost of and um, take efficiency from the, from the economy? Uh, that's, a, that's a very fair question. The thing is that I think it's the opposite. I think, I think it would do right, exactly the opposite, and let me, let me explain why I think it is like that. If you take uh, any contribution to the, to, uh, um, uh, to, the, to the economy that anyone can make as a worker, uh, what is it involved in that production that you make, whatever it is that you do? Well, there, there are skills, there's training, there's uh, your upbringing, there's the talent, there's your intelligence, there's uh, your physical strength, if it, if it means, if it's relevant. In the, it's uh, the tools that you use. It's a lot of things. And among those things is also effort and sacrifice. You could say also it's luck, it can be a, a lot of things. Uh, however, of all those things that I just listed, and, and, and you can probably come up with uh, some more, the only things that you can affect, that you can choose to do more or less, uh, is effort and sacrifice. Can, you, can, can I decide to be taller? I cannot decide to be taller. Can I decide to be smarter? I cannot decide to be smarter. I can only choose to work harder. I can only choose to accept more sacrifices. So, those values are not just morally defendable, as I just pointed out during the presentation. They're also economically uh, sound because they work as incentives for you to be more productive. And that, I'm just saying that uh, accepting for argument's sake, between, uh, uh, to answer your question, that incentives matter and are the material incentives are the only thing that matter in, 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 in what you do at work. I happen to think that uh, there's something else uh, involved. We tend to think that material incentives are very important because we live in a society that rewards, in that, rewards you in those, in those respects. So it is justified that we think that material incentives are the only incentive that matters. However, as I suggested, there's ample literature suggesting that uh, uh, people um, care about other things such as mastery, such as what drives them to work is things such as mastery, self-management, the fact that they control what they do, the fact that they care about what they do. Uh, ask any scientist in any institution here in Trondheim or anywhere else, ask anyone who's passionate about their job. Most of them will, will never talk to you about, about, about salary, about money. Uh, so long, provided that their basic needs are covered. So I think there's something else in play. But even for argument's sake, even for, for argument's, sake, argument's sake, if we accept that material incentives matter, I think that uh, participatory economy and equity still make sense. Um, but I'm wondering also about what you said about balanced job complexes. Uh, wouldn't we lose the advantages because there are some advantages of specialization. Oh, yeah. And I was thinking, if I couldn't do what I do best, I would also be kind of demotivated. No, I mean, I'm the last person who's going to uh, deny that specialization uh, from division of labor is important and that you should specialize in something. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denying that. M maybe you m misunderstood because I was speaking very fast uh, what we meant by balancing the job. It doesn't mean that you are going to uh, be working in every job within the company, like rotation. Today I'm going to be sweeping the floors, tomorrow I'm going to be uh, the accountants, and tomorrow and the day after maybe I'll be doing what I really care about, which is whatever it is, research or whatever. 
It's not what it means. It, what it means is that uh, uh, you will still do what it is you're, you're trained for, what it is that you feel like you have a, a goal in life to do because work is life and we care about what we do. But on the side, you will have to accept to do a little, little things that we have to distribute fairly within workers and within society so that we don't leave out 80% of the workers and that we liberate creativity from those 80%. But that's also important to understand that in the society today, we have a huge pool of workers who are completely repressed. And who knows, maybe we have uh, many Einsteins or many um, Slatan Ibrahimovic who are just uh, not, never given a chance to express their talents. Because I can't uh, imagine Slatan doing accounting. <laughs> Okay, uh, Younes may uh, um, ask his question and Martin may get ready. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Younes Oxili. <laughs> my name is Younes Oxili and I'm from Algeria. My question is uh, for Mr. Fred Pierce. You said in your talk that uh, World Bank expected economic growth in Africa. Uh, how do you think this possible with uh, the wars and the economical uh, and sorry and the political instability in this in this region? Thank you so much. Well, most of Africa isn't at war. Um, there are there are disputes, there are problems, uh, there are disputes over natural resources. There are, okay, we've had the sort of jihadist kind of stuff in, in Mali in recent weeks. But most of Africa, most of the time, is at peace. Um, it is a fact that the economies of many African countries have been growing quite fast for the last decade, five, six, seven, eight, even 10 or 12% uh, annual economic growth. Now, I, I'm not, as I said in my talk, that doesn't mean that that money is getting down to the masses of people. Most of that money typically is being grabbed by a small elite, the people usually in control of the natural resources that are being sold very often to foreign companies, mining companies and timber companies. And a lot of that economic growth is down to uh, those kind of extractive industries. And that's the wrong model for real economic, uh, useful economic development in Africa, which has to be based on using the resources uh, of people, people's resources, their skills, their knowledge, what they want to do. Um, a lot more of it will be about, about domestic agriculture so that Africa can feed itself once again. That's really important. So, I mean, yes, there's economic growth in, in Africa, and it's quite a striking feature of what's been going on in the last decade or so. But right now, I think too much of it is on the wrong track. What I was writing about land grabbing, it was so obvious that governments were willing to hand over large areas of African soil and sometimes African water to foreign companies for pathetically small amount of, amounts of money in the belief that this would somehow magically bring economic development for the people of those countries. And usually it doesn't. So there's a real problem with the, the, the kind of economic model, the idea of how Africa is going to become a better place to live in. And I do think that it's pretty profoundly wrong now. And if they think that they're going to do what China has done, if they think they're going to do what India is trying to do, if they think they're going to do what even Brazil has done by this way, they won't because each of those countries has built their economies on um, national resources, national companies, uh, national education programs to, uh, you know, to educate the workforce, to educate the people. Um, so I think the model, the model in Africa is wrong. So we, we are going to see a lot of conflict in Africa over some of these resources. But let's not write the continent off. Um, Africa is a place where lots of amazing things are going to happen in the next few decades. Some of them will be bad, but many of them will be really good. Thank you. Uh, Martin Baloy may, may ask his question. And uh, Jens Petter Johansen may get ready. 
Martin? Uh, I'm not that tall, right? Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Martin Baloy from South Africa. Uh, my question is directed to both speakers. Uh, I, I, I want to find out if you really do think that uh, Africa does uh, really need democracy, and what kind of democracy does it need? Is it a Western style of democracy where we have to elect or change our leaders each and every five or seven years? Because I, I'm raising this question because when I look at the countries which are in Africa, uh, with, I can give you two instances, Libya, and, and Equatorial Guinea, these countries, they don't have democracy. Or they, like Libya's unfortunate case, it was bombed to the ground, but they were doing great and doing so well. The country had the best social welfare system uh, and, and a good uh, social security for its population. And they had the best education, uh, one of the best in Africa. And then the human development index was high in Africa and they were even high as compared to most European uh, countries. And then, uh, so I, I'm questioning the fact that if we, we, we impose to ourselves a Western style of democracy where we have to elect our leaders each and every five years, it is dragging the continent backwards than forward because we, our main focus is economic growth and social development. I, I can give you an instance about my, my country, uh, South Africa. Uh, we, 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 the current ruling party is African National Congress, which is uh, uh, a, liber a liberation organization. It, it, it has been in power ever since democracy when apartheid was dismantled. Then the, the opposition, which is Democratic Alliance, it does not believe in all policies which this ruling parties believe in. So that simply means that the current policies which uh, the ruling party in my country uh, are executing, when they are voted out of power, DA Democratic Allowance, which is the opposition party, will come with new policies of which all the projects which were being done in my country will be taken backward because they are the projects which are implemented by the policies which the opposition party does not believe. So. My suggesting or the way I look at things was that, uh, for instance, with Libya uh, and Equatorial Guinea, they got uh, the head or they have a, a national working council. We have or, to keep the question short. I'm or, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting it. I'm finishing. They got a national working committee where they discuss the aspirations and the interest of the nation, and they implement and implement them from those uh, uh, working uh, or, or planning councillors, and that do, they are really working for their countries. No, thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I personally believe in one of the uh, basic moral principles which says that we are responsible for the consequences of our own acts. So um, since you know I was introduced as Spanish house slash French, my French health uh, has a very ugly record in, the, in, in Africa. So to answer your the question, what kind of democracy do I hope for for Africa? First, well, first of all, that would be the kind of uh, democracy that where uh, France nor any external power interferes in the, in the name of their own interest. It would be the kind of power that, that started to bloom at the beginning of the 60s with uh, Patrick Lumumba before he got assassinated. It's the, kind of, uh, it's the kind of democracy that we could have seen in other countries, like in Cameroon. It's definitely not the kind of, uh, uh, of democracy, so-called democracy, that we uh, are so apologetic about when we talk about uh, Gabon, or where France has a huge interest. So my, my, my reply uh, basically would be, uh, I think the democracy that Africa needs is the one that Africans want, first and mm -hmm. foremost. Thank you. Fred? Yeah, I, I go along very much I mean, with that. Um, democracy isn't something which can be imported as a, as a sort of model. Uh, countries have to work out the form of democratic control that they want, and there is no other way of doing it than within those countries. I am always amazed whenever I go to um, sub-Saharan African countries, and North Africa come to that as well, at the power and the, the, the enthusiasm of civil society groups, of 
NGO groups, of activists, people trying to work to improve things. Um, somehow in many countries that, that optimism and that, and that desire for change doesn't translate into change at the top. There seems to be a kind of ceiling above which it doesn't get and the, there, are, there are elites that have too much control. We have to break through that. But I don't think that just that means just bringing in Western or any or Asian models come to that um, into Africa. It means working it out um, for yourself. But I mean, I think there is great dynamism, great optimism in some areas in Africa, and these things uh, can be worked out. Thank you, Jens Peter Johansen. May. Uh ask his question, and uh, Kristin, the value may get ready. Hello, my name is Jens Petter Johansen, and I am from Norway. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Martin, but I think it applies to both. Uh, it's a question about a concept. I don't really understand the concept of growth, continuous growth, economic growth, 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 growth. And uh, my question is, no, it's not the question yet, actually. Uh, because every company or country being uh, capitalistic or based on central planning, is uh, the success criteria is uh, how much they grow each year. Not long after the concept of sustainable development was coined, the concept of sustainable growth sur surfaced. And to me, it seems like a paradox that in a world with li limited resources, uh, all economic systems are based on the idea that we should grow each year. So my question is, do we need a system based on another ID than growth, or can we grow sustainable forever? Thank you. Well, okay. Growth has, has um, become an ugly word because it implies, it's just like efficiency. It's one of those words that, be, that has become a, a bad word because of what it implies in today's society. It means growth for the sake of it and then exploitation for the sake of, for, of profits, which we are not even enjoying anymore. Uh, so I, if, if that is the growth we're talking about, then I agree with you, why growth, growth, growth. However, uh, we, can, we could imagine another type of economy, another type of society where uh, growth could mean something else. I mean, if the type of growth that we talk about is the type of, uh, of benefits that we can enjoy, social benefits that we can enjoy, uh, are not exceeding the social cost. And by social cost, it means really so, real social cost, no, nothing externalized. Uh, then growth should be a good thing, if we want it. I mean, again, what it should be is uh, 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 this decision making according to uh, the degree one we are affected. It means that if we want growth, and that growth means maybe, I don't know, um, uh, using less resources, using less resources to produce the same thing that we want today, then growth is good in that respect, okay? So if growth means that the gains in productivity can be transformed tomorrow whenever we want into leisure time because we want to and we can decide that democratically, then growth is good. Or growth in certain countries where uh, a lot of people here are coming from, growth is good in itself today because it means at least to have some certain infrastructures where you can build a society on. So growth depends on where you stand on. Thank you. And it's also nice. Yeah, I, I agree very strongly with that. It depends what growth you're talking about. Uh, you can have um, growth, which is, as you say, about using resources more efficiently. And we're going to have to have a huge amount of that because the world currently uses resources very inefficiently. Um, and if better economic activity can help them, so much the better. There is something quite interesting about growth. Um, in most of the West, we have stopped using more resources for our economies. This predates the, um, the economic crisis of 2007, 2008. Starting about 10 or 12 years ago, we stopped using more water. We stopped using more minerals. We stopped using, um, we stopped driving as much, oddly. oddly. Driving is becoming less. Maybe that's because we're using social media and we, don't, and we don't need to drive to, to do everything that we used to do. I'm not sure. 
But there are two things I think going on here. One of which is changing lifestyles, and one of it is one. Of, the other thing is just being more efficient in the way that we use resources. Now, I'm not saying that means that all you know all our problems are over. And we, but researchers have a phrase for this. They call it peak stuff. We're not increasing the amount of stuff that we use every year. And even though sometimes our economies are still growing in terms of sort of dollars or euros as you count them, the actual amount of resources of the planet that we're using are not anymore increasing. And that's, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Now, it'd be a long time, I think, before, you know, some poorer countries reach that point. But it does, again, it's like peak population. It doesn't solve our problems. But it kind of suggests that there's a pathway out there somewhere by which we can get through all those really scary problems about resources and pollution and all those things that we worry about, about the sustainability of life on, on this planet and a sustainable economy. It suggests that there may be a way through all that. And that's the kind of thing that I was really talking about, about how things may play out over, over the coming decades. We might find a way of doing things better. And in some respects, maybe we already are. There are certainly some ideas out there. Thank you. Uh, Kristin may come forward. And uh, Macy Crook may get ready. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So Macy will be uh, the last one to ask her a question. Uh, my name is Kristen DeValue. I'm from the United States. <laughs> um, so I have a question for Fred. Uh, you spoke about agricultural production and the need to produce more. But some people argue that, oh, <laughs> that we already produce enough for, um, for everyone. And there are about a billion people who are obese, many of them in my country, um, and a billion people who are going hungry. Um, and so that it seems that one of the problems is really in distribution of resources. So do you have any suggestions for the decommodification of land and agriculture? Uh, you're, you're absolutely right that, that there, a, a lot of this is about waste. Um, we already, there are seven billion people on the planet. We already produce enough food for at least 10 billion. You might argue if we all went vegetarian, 13 or 14 billion people. There is enough food produced on this planet to feed the whole world and feed the whole world well. We waste fantastic amounts of it. In, in the rich world, we throw food away. The, the stores throw food away because it's past its sell-by date. We and our homes throw food away. Um, in much of the developing world where people uh, are much more reluctant to do that, they tend to use everything they've got. There are huge amounts of wastage just from stuff that uh, you get rots in warehouses or you can't get, the, can't get it to market quickly enough before it rots. The big agribusiness people try to persuade us that you've got to bring in agribusiness, you've got to bring in high tech, ge genetic modification, lots of pesticides, all that stuff, so that we can produce more food. But really that's not the issue. We already produce enough food. The problem is um, yeah, there's obesity is, is another part of this, but the real the problem is we can't figure out how to use that food well, uh, how to distribute it properly, how to make sure that all the food that we produce actually is eaten rather than wasted. And then there are other issues like biofuels, huge amounts of grain, corn is now used for biofuels rather than feeding people. That's madness. Um, and we also use a lot of land, not for growing food, but for growing rubber or growing cotton or growing tobacco and all that kind of stuff. So um, we can feed the world. Actually, I think feeding the world in terms of the amount of food that we need to produce is pretty easy. We're quite good at doing that. The real problems are about poverty and about equality and about getting the food to the people we need it because the system, the market system for food distribution and production around the world is not geared to doing that at all. It's geared to producing profits for a few people. We've got to get over that. Uh, we, you know, the, the I, you know, it's not a, it's not ultimately a resource problem. I don't think this one. It's a, it's a social and an economic problem. Thank you. Uh, any comments? Okay, uh, Maisie. 
Where are you? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I have a question for David, actually. Actually, I have many questions, but since, I, since we have one, so I have one. Uh, we can speak so, afterwards as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have a question about how would you like your vision, because I hope that your vision is not just an academical one. How would you like to make it come true, make it uh, uh, a reality? So what, what would you like to, uh, to see? Is this going to be an organization, or how, how would you like structure, or is it going to be a revolution? Which I hope it's not, because we have like, bad experience in leftist revolution in Poland. Uh, so, yeah, how would you want to be, so your whole vision? Well, as much as I enjoy coming here and being treated so nicely by the people here, uh, I wouldn't bother traveling all the way to, from Madrid to, uh, to the north of Norway if I didn't think that a uh, uh, participatory economy actually makes sense and is viable and it can be implemented. And to answer the, your question is how can we implement that today already and how can we um, move from here to there? Well, uh, the answer, first of all, is the same answer I gave. First of all, organize. Once you organize, once you have uh, social movements that are big enough, first of all, be coherent with yourselves. Notice that the, 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 the mental state in which we are when we already think that there's a long-term vision is much, different, much more different than what we have today in certain movements that fight the good fight, that's uh, an expression that's being used when, when they mean we're doing this because we think it's morally right. But we kind of think that we are never going to, to win because we're swimming upstream. However, when you have a long-term vision and you really believe in it, uh, the energy is not the same. Uh, you think of really enlarging your movement like we are now in IOPS. Uh, you're really working pragmatically to within the society where you're in. And you try to be coherent with yourself by implementing some of the features whenever you can within your own movement. So um, um, I don't need to wait 50 years from now to have a movement like IOPS, which implements uh, self-management, which implements equity, if we can implement equity, or a balanced job complex. Or uh, the fact that we have a bottom-up democracy with, uh, with uh, chapters in, in, in my neighborhood in Madrid, which is Lava Pies. Uh, forming as another council, which is the Council of Madrid. Together with all the other councils of the cities in Spain, they form the National Council of uh, Spain, and then all the national councils, they form IOPS, International Organization for a Participatory Society. So be coherent with yourself. If you really believe that uh, it's, it, it's, it's meant to work, then try to implement it today. And you can learn a lot from it, of course, because I'm not saying that this is it. It's written. We don't need to think anymore about it. It needs to be constantly uh, justified, questioned, criticized, experienced, and we can learn a lot from it. Thank you. Okay, that was the last question, fortunately. Um, some of you may be around for uh, questions afterwards. I'll yeah. stay. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. And also a big thank you for the audience for very good questions tonight. So. Baby, hey, hey, hey.